This is uh, the first lecture on the uh, Arkhipov Bezrokovnikov theorem. So basically, I'm going to state the theorem and then we won't return to it the whole lecture. Um, but just to, so that you know where we're going. So this is the statement. Last time we established the isomorphism between the equivariant K-theory of the Steinberg variety and the affine Hecker algebra by seeing that they both act in the same way on the antispherical module. So in the coherent realization, the antispherical module was the G check times C star equivariant K-theory of the cotangent bundle the flag variety and in the constructible realization it was this um, induced module which was which tends it over hf the sine module and what we did last time was establish an isomorphism here And these are both faithful modules, and this allowed us to deduce that the, um, the Cajunalistic isomorphism. And what I've um, repeatedly said is that we want to categorify the Cajunalistic isomorphism. So the Cajunalistic isomorphism is the statement that a G check times C star equivariant K theory of the Steinberg is isomorphic to the affine Hecker algebra. We would like to categorify this statement and uh, the first step in categorifying this statement is to categorify this isomorphism and we will do this um, in some sense without extra structure so um, in the decategorified case it was easy to see that these two vector spaces are isomorphic it's a few lines you work out what that side is it's got a basis given by co-characters and or, or characters of G check. And so does this side. Okay. So it's pretty easy. Whereas what we'll see um, in the next few weeks is that this isomorphism underlies a non-trivial equivalence of, um, so on here you have some category of constructible sheaves and on here you have some category of coherent sheaves. And that equivalence is the archipop bezel kavnikov theorem. So I'll state, so this is the, which was published in 2008, which is the statement that um, the derived category of G check times C star equivalent coherent sheaves on um, DB co. is equivalent to something that I'll call D Iwahori Whitaker mix. And then uh, there's another version. So here we have the forgetful functor forgetting the action of C star. We have equivalences like this. And just um, a remark is that this is this is kind of like forgetting Frobenius. So if you want to convince yourself to level zero that this is a deep equivalence. You just need to notice that something rather easy on the left-hand side, namely a C star action, corresponds to something um, extremely subtle on the right-hand side, namely a Frobenius action. Um, and there's many other, I mean, I'll go through other reasons why, um, why one should expect this to be a rather non-trivial statement. Uh, okay, so, 
I just want to um, very briefly um, change notation slightly. So I'll go over this this week and then I'll go over it again next week. So uh, we've, for the Hecker algebra, for the affine Hecker algebra, we had the standard basis HX, where X is in the affine Hecker algebra, and this lattice part. And I want to replace these from now on with delta x and I don't want to change the notation for the lattice part. Lattice part. Um, so this is the standard basis. And um, the Cartesian analytic basis should be um, And the reason that I'm doing this, I actually started doing this last term and then I kind of forgot and went back to this, this notation, <laughs> but I want to go back to the other notation. And the reason is um, small letters uh, growth and group. and big letters. objects in the categorification okay and I just think that this um, simplifies things and I was going to go over um, how to um, how to what these things are what these categorified antispherical module what this categorified antispherical module is I think I'll leave that to next week uh, just because I started writing notes and it became way too long Okay, so next week we'll go through what um, what the right-hand side is. For this lecture, you just have to believe me that, um, that this thing exists. And um, so what are we doing now? So how on earth do you get some grip on such an equivalence? And the approach of... Um, of Archibald Bezrokavnikov and Bezrokavnikov is very soft in a sense that, um, I mean, this paper is just extraordinary um, in the sense that what happens is that you just notice that various um, extra levels of structure imply rather deep things about, um, so I'll just draw a kind of schematic. Um, so these categories are linear over point mod g check. This says, this is just the statement that given any representation of g check, I can pull it back and tensor up here. And so these categories, so they have a linear structure over coherent cheese on this. And then um, they, the, nil, the Springer resolution also maps to um, the Lie algebra, so they're linear over this. And then finally, they're linear over um, co n tilde tension. Okay. So, so I will go over this um, in more detail in future lectures. But, um, sorry, this goes the wrong way. So if you imagine that you have something that you suspect is equivalent to this, you can first ask, um, what is this structure? And then you can ask, what is this structure? And then you can ask, what is this structure? And what Archipal Bezra Kamnikov explained is that um, each time lifting up here corresponds to some rather simple and manageable extra piece of information. Okay. And the starting point is this arrow here. And this is given by gates Green central sheaves. So 
So basically, this lecture will just be a review of Emily's lecture, um, very briefly. And then I just want to go over uh, the, the example of GL2 and the natural representation in painstaking detail because we see so much in this one simple example. It's essentially the only example we can do by hand. Uh, and it's remarkable that we see really a lot of stuff in this, in this example. Are there any questions so far? Um, are those stacks or when you write point mod, um, do you check? Yes. So th this is always, I'm thinking of these as stacks. And so you can just equivalently think about this as G check equivariant sheaves on a point, G check equivariant sheaves on G check, on little G check, or G check equivariant sheaves on the nil potent, on the Springer resolution. So an extremely important role in this theory is played by the notion of a category being linear over some stack, um, which I'll go into in future weeks. But the simplest example of being linear over a stack is being a module category for representations of a group. So that means you're linear over point mod that group. So now, um, Kate's Greece Central Cheese. Okay, so uh, I just want to recall the setting. So we have um, H, the affine Hecker algebra. And inside this, we have this lattice part, which is a direct sum over. So I should be careful with uh, which side of Langland's duality I'm on always now. So I want to um, use G to build my um, affine grass mining, etc. And so um, Kai denotes the characters. I check the co-characters. And the affine vial group is okay. So last week, because I was only on the dual side and the week before, I stopped writing checks everywhere, but I'm because I'm jumping back between uh, the dual side and the non-dual side now, I have to really be careful to put the checks in the right places. And so if you think a check should be there, just let me know. Um, so this... Can I just part, say that the um, Z brackets shouldn't be there? Thank you. So the lattice part... Um, So we went, we've been over this Bernstein presentation and then the theorem of Bernstein is that the center of the affine Hecker algebra is the WF invariance. And this is the same thing this is canonically isomorphic to um, Z B plus or minus one tensor over Z of the representation ring of the dual group. 
Okay, and um, last semester we saw that this is significant in terms of the representation theory of periodic groups. Um, and I want to emphasize one other point that I didn't emphasize so much um, when I was initially talking about the Bernstein Center, but Emily did discuss in her talk, which is another remarkable aspect of this story. So if we think about H as being Iwahori invariant functions on the affine flag variety, let's say with values in C. So here, um, temporarily, um, I'm considering G of FQT contains G. contains I the Uahori. So this um, Hecker algebra is I invariant functions on the flag variety or I times I invariant functions on the um, on the group with compact support. And now what we can do is we can push forward to an I invariant function on the um, affine Grassmannian with compact support. And we can also regard an I, a G, o, a G, um, O, so this is O invariant function with compact support. We just have the inclusion here. And now the um, second part of the theorem. Oops. Is that if I take the um, center inside here and push it forward, uh, this agrees with the whole, so this is the spherical Hecker algebra here. Their images agree. Another way of thinking about this is that, so um, is at least the statement clear? So we will see a categorification of this statement later on. Um, and it's very beautiful and very useful. So please tell me if it's not comprehensible. So I'll just give a Hecker algebra version of this statement. Ready? Yeah. There's slightly more, right? Like that, that the restriction to Z is injective. Ah, yes. Sorry. That, that, that this is... Well, that's a very nice morphism. Oh, no.
So now the Hecker algebra version of this is we take, so um, we take H the affine Hecker algebra and H spherical here can be realized as this is the cardinalistic element for the um, longest element of the finite bar group. And this spherical Hecker algebra can be realized as being, you can think about this idempotent as basically saying, this is a projection to things that are invariant on the left by G of O. And then we want it to be invariant on the left and the right. And so we should form this intersection. Where BWF um, and now um, in this Hecker algebra version, you can kind of well for me it's it's nice because if I hit something on the left, so then I have this map down to H B W F and I have the inclusion. But if I take something in here that's central and I hit it with BWF, then it automatically um, is in the image of multiplication on the left with BWF also. And then the statement, so is that Z is isomorphic to the spherical Hecker algebra via the map that sends H to H times B. Okay, so now when we uh, categorify, that's what Gatesview tells us how to do. So, please complain if that slide moved too fast. It did. It did? Thanks. Oops. So, Jordi, I'm just trying to get the notation straight in my head. So, um, so Z is isomorphic to the spherical Hecke algebra, which mm -hmm. is isomorphic to rep G check, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. But if we go a little bit above in this page, um, then it seems like you had an additional tensoring with Z, V. Oh, uh, this is just, I mean, the spherical Hecker algebra, this is linear over Z, over Laurent polynomials in VV inverse. Okay. And that's all that is about. So both but, I mean, these, just in terms of the size. Um, maybe it's helpful to notice that if I specialize V to anything, then it's what you'd expect. Uh -huh. So v, now V is a formal variable. Okay. That could be the order of your residue field. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, it's a kind of funny thing. Like, um, you know, of course, uh, um, yeah, for me, there's a funny thing. Like up here, V is very important, shows up in structure constants and stuff like this. And when you move to the spherical Hecker algebra, V is just along for the ride. Another way of saying this is just the fact that convolution on the affine Grassmannian preserves perverse sheaves. And so, and the V becomes a shift and usually when I convolve two things, I get shifts measured by a V, but here I ne never get any shifts. And so V just comes along for the ride. 
so somehow this Q you're saying plays a more important role in the affine Heck algebra than in the spherical one. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Is that somehow related to the motivic nature of the spherical one where the... Um, I don't somehow think so. Okay. It's much more, it's just much more related to this miracle that perverse convolved with perverse is perverse. Because both things have a motivic nature, I would say. Um, okay, I'll get on to the gate screw slide now. So, theorem. Uh, is that there exists a central functor. So I'll comment on central in a second. Um, from P. Um, so here we change back. So O is CT. K is CT. Affine grass mining is G, K mod G of O, etc. So this is perverse sheaves on the G of O equivalent sheaves on the affine grass mining to perverse sheaves, I equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll comment on central in a second. And I just want to show that the, that, so the analog of the fact that, um, that the Bernstein center, the analog of the first statement of, of Bernstein's theorem is just the fact that this is a central functor. So I'll say more precisely what this means in a second, but basically it's image commutes with everything in, in the Hecker category. Um, and moreover, uh, we can do the following. So we can start with I equivariant sheaves on the flag variety, and we can push forward. to I equivariant sheaves on the Grassmannian. So remember that pi from flags to gr is a G mod B vibration. I mean, that's irrelevant for understanding the statement, but just for background of what's going on. Um, and so here we have this, uh, so I'll just start writing P for perverse. We have this functor and the following, and here we can just um, forget equivariance. And this diagram commutes. So roughly what you can think, um, and we'll see this in an example, is that these are in some sense reasonably easy sheaves. And now what we're doing is producing some rather complicated things up here with the miraculous property that when we push back forward, we get the things that we started with. And when you see examples of this, it just looks like complete magic. 
Uh, and what does this central mean? It's a little bit tricky, so at least for me. So what this means is that um, for all, I mean, the following is a subset of what this means. For all, if I have a perverse sheaf on the affine Grassmannian, and I have a perverse sheaf on affine flags, then um, this functor applied to F, this, the first miracle is that this is perverse. So what we were discussing before with Masood is that generally if I convolve two things in here, the result is not a perverse sheath. But these Z of Fs have the magical property that no matter what I convolve them with, no matter which perverse sheaf I convolve them with inside here, I get a perverse sheaf, which is rather unexpected. Um, and so is and we have a canonical isomorphism Okay, so this is what. So central also means that there's a whole lot of braiding compatibilities. So for example, I can, I can first, um, so this is a symmetric monoidal category. And so I can first switch here and then tensor and blah, 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 blah. Okay. And there's a whole lot of diagrams that should commute. But just a remark, which um, is a little bit half baked. Um, so I think the best way to think about a central functor, so giving a central functor to a monoidal category is the same thing as giving a functor to the Drinfeld center of that monoidal category as a functor. So, um, Functor to okay, um, and um, I'm not not one hundred percent sure. So the Drinfeld center um, consists of objects together with an isomorphism um, between tensoring with that object on the left and the right. And in general, the Drinfeld center of a monoidal category is a braided monoidal category. And now it makes sense to ask what is the symmetric center of a braided monoidal category, i.e which of those, which objects satisfy the um, condition that their braiding is symmetric. And I think that this functor lands in the symmetric center of the Drinfeld center. So I think if we went through Emily's talk carefully enough, it would, this statement would be clear whether it's true or not. Symmetric center. Of Greenfield Center. Okay. 
So if I take an algebra, then I can take the center of that algebra and then that's as commutative as that could ever be. But if I take a monoidal category and take its Drinfeld center, this is a braided monoidal category, which is not as commutative as things can be. There's another step which is, um, which is passing to the symmetric center. And so, um, anyway, th this is just a remark. Um, and I think that it also explains in Emily's, Emily's talk, we had some questions about, is this the whole um, Grinfeld center of the affine Hecker category? And the answer is no. And um, probably one might guess that it's the whole symmetric center of the Grinfeld center. Okay? So it's the kind of easy part of the Grinfeld center. So you can take all that with a grain of salt if you wish. Um, what you cannot take um, with a grain of salt is that everything does um, for not everything Bezra Kavnikov does in life, but everything that Bezra Kavnikov does in the direction of this course is built on Z. So get used to thinking about it. So now uh, I want to give an extended example. Are there any questions based on this? So now we have the extended example. Which will probably take me the rest of the lecture. Which is the um, if we consider that, so we take G equals GL2. Uh, so G check is GL2. And I take Nat to be the natural representation. And now I consider F Nat inside this is Satake category. So this is the sheaf that corresponds to the natural representation of GL2. And we describe um, Z of F nat. And uh, I'll go into quite a lot of detail of, in this example uh, because I think it's very beautiful and it's very instructive and it's also a, basically the only example that anyone can do <laughs> explicitly, which is kind of amazing. Like the simplest case beyond the trivial representation is the natural representation of uh, GL2 and this is already rather complicated. So I first want to outline in broad, give a broad outline of what we'll do, and then we'll um, roll up our sleeves and do it. So firstly, there's algebra, which um, see the exercise sheet. So um, the affine Hecker algebra for GL2 is the affine Hecker algebra for SL2, semi-direct product, some generators, um, so this is a generator of length zero elements.
And we can also think about this as generated by delta S, delta S zero, length zero element. So this is the um, simple reflection, the finite simple reflection. This is the affine um, simple reflection. And uh, that's the length zero element. And we have uh, ds, d length zero element is ds zero, d length zero element, ds zero, d length zero element, ds, d length zero element. So perhaps you're more familiar with the um, affine Hecker algebra of PGL2, which has kind of two Hecker algebra generators and then an extra element, um, which is of order two, which interchanges these two generators. And the quotient of this algebra by the central element would reproduce that. But here, here the length zero elements have infinite order. Um, the Bernstein, so this is um, also has a Bernstein presentation. So students, please um, do the exercise sheet. Um, and kind of theta one is These are the Bernstein generators. Okay, so the element that um, we want to categorify is so kind of Z nat, which will be the element in the center of the affine Hecker algebra corresponding to this representation will be theta one plus theta two. So this is the character of the natural representation of GL two. And that's the same thing as and the question is kind of how to produce said nat geometrically. Okay. So all of this is explained in detail on the exercise sheet and I'd heavily recommend doing it. Ah, I went too fast, sorry. So now we move to geometry. Are there any questions on this? So geometry. So we have the affine flag writing and the affine Grassmannian. And the components are indexed by Z. So this is either under geometric Sotake, this is the degree of the representation of, um, of GL2. And um, in the lattice 
language, it's the determinant, the valuation of the determinant of the lattice. And it's also the power of this length zero element. So the length zero element just moves us between these components. So it's the kind of M. Okay. So everything So the natural representation has degree one and everything takes place on the components indexed by one. So we ignore the others. So uh, what's the picture? So um, Gates Grease family. Is the following. So it's a family over the um, over A1. And the fiber is the Afan Grassmannian times G mod B. And the fiber at zero is the Afan flag value. So this is what's sitting over a non-zero point, and this is what's sitting over zero. And uh, just, so what is this family? Roughly speaking, it is a vector bundle on A1 together with a trivialization away from a point x and a flag in the fiber at zero. So when this point x is not zero, then this reduces to a trivialization away from a point and a flag and they don't interact with each other, which is why I get this product. And now when um, where over zero, we have a lattice together with a flag in that lattice modulo t times that lattice, where t is the parameter. And that's a model for the affine flag variety of type A. And uh, so nat, our representation nat, corresponds to the um, constant sheaf. I'll just write. So K is Q, R, or C. The constant sheaf on a P1. So this natural representation. So, um, and wh what we do in gates grease construction is we take out um, the thing that we want to centralize, like that we want to make central. We put it here and we put the skyscraper here. And we extend this to everything and then we take nearby cycles. And the picture 
will be that this P1 will give us like a P1, so a P1. Over lambda not equal to zero. And then in the zero fiber, we'll see that this P1 degenerates two copies of P1. And these are the two, um, this will be the Schubert, these are the two Schubert curves. So they're parameterized by something like And you could kind of see this. So back up here, back up in the algebra world. We can rewrite this as being And so you would strongly suspect that this is supported on the two Schubert, Schubert curves with some funny business at zero. And that's exactly what this um, nearby cycles will produce. It's, it'll produce a sheaf supported here with some funny business going on here. No one's got questions. I have a silly question, Jordy. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're defining the spherical Hecke module as a sub of the Hecke algebra, mm -hmm. does it matter that the canonical basis element for the longest element of the finite file group is a quasi idempotent rather than an idempotent? Like, do you have to divide out by the Poincare polynomial of the. Um, no, so you can convince yourself that, um, I mean, it, <coughs> it's, it's, pretty so you need to worry about this when you multiply things mm. but when you're just looking at a module you don't need to worry about this because like if i look at the module generated by some element or a scalar multiple of it it doesn't yeah, change. I, okay yeah sure
So that's the um, that's the rough um, roughly what's going on. Uh, so let's go to the details. Uh, so firstly, I want to I want to um, just discuss a, a simple model of this, just a degeneration, a quadric degeneration inside um, P2, which I'll explain, um, and then um, and then do the calculation of nearby cycles and things for that model, and then in the second bit, I'll explain that that model is in fact correct. And that model does represent what's actually going on inside Gatesbury's family. So the first half of this um, second bit will be basically elementary um, perverse sheaves on um, small things. And then I'll try to um, convince you that this model is actually real. Um, so now I just want to give a lovely application of balance and gluing, very simple application of balance and gluing. Can anyone tell me, does gluing need an E or not? I couldn't work that work this out um, by pure thought. No idea. Anyway, you, Emily's saying no. Okay. Uh, so we want to understand, um, we take the set X, Y, inside C2, stratified by lambda, which is um, x-axis without zero, union y-axis without zero, union zero. And so let's call this X. It's good to call it X because it actually is what it looks like. And we, we want to understand curve lambda on X. And notice that uh, that away from zero, perv is very simple. It's just two local systems. So this is easy away from zero. And Balenson tells us how to glue together perverse sheaves on. So zero is exactly the um, zero set of a function. So note that <coughs> if we take f equals x plus y, then f equals zero intersected with x is zero. And so Balance and Gluing tells us that perv lambda of x Remember the following general recipe, we have F, a perverse sheaf on on X take away zero plus, um, I'm going to, so this will be a perverse sheaf on a point, namely on zero which, so in general, this would be a perverse sheaf on Z, which is the zero set of F. But uh, here, this zero set is just a point. So I'm just going to call it V zero, a perverse sheaf on 
on zero. So these are our pieces and now we need the glue and the glue is a map from the um, nearby cycles of F. So we consider the nearby cycles of F together with, so this has a monodromy endomorphism and we take the monodromy endomorphism minus one. So mu is the monodromy. And we want a factorization. So this nearby cycles, remember, is a sheaf on the zero set of F. So it's just a vector space. And we have um, a factorization like this. Now, let's um, unpack this a little bit. So x without zero is just the x-axis, the invertible elements along the x-axis plus the invertible elements along the y-axis. So this is just um, the same thing as a vector space together with monotropy and another vector space together with monotropy. Okay, so implicitly I'm saying that this is the nearby cycles of this, that this perverse sheaf is determined by its nearby cycles. Okay. So imagine just a perverse sheaf on a disk on C star, then the nearby cycles at zero is simply a nearby, a nearby stalk together with its monodromy. So I can rebuild the perverse sheaf just by knowing its nearby cycles. So this becomes the following diagram. So we have these together with their monodromy. And then we have maps in both directions. And I can never remember which one is called can and which one's called C, so CX, VX, CY, CY. So it's diagrams of vector spaces of this form such that for, for Z either being X or Y, um, VX of CX is the monodromy minus one. Okay. It's a beautiful little example of valence and gluing at work. Uh, and now, um, this, what we're actually interested in is two P1s joining transversely at a point, not this affine chart. Uh, and so, that simplifies the situation remarkably. So hence, if X is now P1 X union P1 Y is the zero set of X Y inside P2 so this is this will be our two Schubert cells. This will be our two Then we get the same description But we want this monodromy um, we want this local system to extend without poles over infinity. So we want the monodromy at infinity to be zero. So, sorry, to be one. But um, we have points at infinity.
force ux equal mu y equal one. And so now this term here becomes zero. And so we get that perv Let's call this X bar. Such that, oops. Such that V Z of CZ is zero. Okay, so going here or here is zero. Now I want to leave the following to an exercise or lunch discussion or something. Is that okay up to there? Um, can you explain why monodromy is one again? So, um, so I have my x and y, and they intersect in zero. But now what I'm doing is adding, adding to each of these c's a point at infinity to make a p1. So on each, of those, on each of those p1s, I have a special point, the point where I'm allowed singularities, which I'll call zero. And then I have that point at infinity. But now um, I want, um, so I want my local system to be a local system on, on C. Like C star with infinity is a copy of C. And hence this cannot have any monodromy. Um, okay, so the following is an exercise which we can discuss. If you would really like to, me to go over this, I can, um, I can go over this, but um, it's not too difficult. Um, so we consider a new thing that I did also called Let's call it um, oh, uh, curly Y. Which is the following subset inside P2 times A1, which is X, Y, Z, lambda, such that X, Y equals lambda, Z squared. And so this is a family and the um, a picture of this family looks similar to what we saw before. So here we have A1. So if lambda is zero, this becomes x, y equals zero. This is the fiber over zero. And the fiber over um, over lambda not equal to zero is x y equals lambda z squared. 
inside P2, which is a smooth quadric for lambda not equal to zero. Okay, so in And now the exercise is the following. Show that the nearby cycle, so let's, of the constant sheaf on y0, so y0 is y without f inverse of zero. Shifted by two to make it perverse, is described under the above equivalence by the following diagram of vector spaces. So we K This would be my CX, CX, CY, CY. Is it clear what this diagram means? So this is my V0, this is my VX, this is my VY, and this map here is just an isomorphism on, on this copy and an isomorphism on this copy. Okay, and it's indeed the case that if I go boom and back here, so this thing is in the kernel of this map. So this composition is zero and this composition is zero. And part B is deduce that this nearby cycles has composition series given by, it's got an IC0 at the top, ICP1X plus ICP1Y, IC0 at the bottom. Okay, so I stated this um, example in in lectures before. Um, I don't think I proved it though. Okay, so the exercise is to prove it. And lastly, um, check that the monodromy Okay, up to scalar, if you know that this is the composition series, there's a unique map that, so this is the head of this object in the abelian category. This is the largest semi-simple quotient. And this is the socal, this is the largest semi-simple sub. And so there's a unique map that maps onto the head and then back includes it back as the socal. And the claim is that this is the monodromy of this dude. Okay. So in this picture, the monodromy um, is takes this one 
down into this one and is zero here. And um, just for amusement's sake, remark, this, I just want to make this remark because it'll be important later on. There's something called a wacky moto, moto filtration that will be very important for us later on. So if we let um, so inside um, I'm calling it X bar, we have C um, X infinity. So the, the C that contains that is the X axis plus the point at infinity. J, and we have J prime, which is C Y infinity. And this object here, which I'll call curly Z, has two filtrations, namely So this thing is a sub, this bit here. So it has a J lower star constant shape on C X infinity and above it a J shriek of K, C, Y, infinity. And the other way around, okay, you can see this in this example um, over here. This would be this piece and then this piece. And this is the wacky moto, this is so-called wacky moto filtration. Filtration. And if you think that something like shrieks correspond to standard objects and stars correspond to um, co-standard objects, then this is reflected in the fact that we've seen this, this central element, this central guy has an expression as delta S plus delta S zero inverse. And so one of these expressions corresponds to this filtration and one of these expressions corresponds to this expression. Okay. And this might seem a little bit incomprehensible at this stage, um, and apologies if it is, but just um, try to keep these things alive in your mind and we'll see them again and again. So this wacky moto filtration will be extremely important. Um, and here we're seeing it in this example. Okay, so now I have 20 minutes and I want to connect it to um, Gates Grease picture. Any questions? Two expressions are the same though. Is, it, is that what you meant to write? The addition is swapped. Say again? Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs>
And another one of Roman's kind of major insights is the importance of these Wakimoto filtrations. So uh, before I mentioned this remarkable fact that when you convolve with a central sheaf, it stays perverse. One of the ways of seeing this is that using Wakimoto filtrations. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So how do we connect to gate screws picture? So uh, recall, CF Emily's IFS talk, and remember that we're taking G equals GL2. GL2. And I also should say that uh, half of what, I've ex what I'm explaining here was worked out by Emily. This is, um, so I've tried to do this example a number of times and always failed and um, somehow um, trying to do it with Emily was very helpful. So we take, um, what's a good name for the trivial representation, trivial bundle? Um, I was using epsilon zero, but uh, I'll call it E triv. So this is the trivial rank two bundle on A1. And so we have um, the kind of family version of the affine Grassmannian, which is the set of X, E, B, where um, E is a rank two vector bundle and beta is a trivialization of E away from the point X. And then, um, and so this maps down to A1. And because we have a global coordinate, this is a Gruer vibration. Now, Gatesgree's version is X, E, B, F, where this is all the same stuff, plus F is a flag in the fiber at zero of this vector bundle. I, E, align. So this thing is the fiber of this vector bundle, this two-dimensional vector bundle. So this is just a two-dimensional vector space. And all we're doing is choosing a line in this two-dimensional vector space. And as I hinted at before, over A1 without zero, this is a um, Gruer times P1 vibration and over A1 over zero, this is simply the affine flag variety. Now, when we were trying to understand the affine Grassmannian, we imposed conditions to make it kind of a finite dimensional situation. And we can do the same thing here. Um, we can consider a relative version of the kind of simplest part of the affine Grassmannian which is G. So um, I'll, I'll write it down and then I'll explain. So 
let L triv be the corresponding OX module. So this is CT E1. CTE2. And then we denote by G the set of L inside L0 such that the dimension of L0 take away L1 is 1. And this is a trivial P1 bundle. Over A1. L0 is L triv there, right? Ah, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I've got L0 in my notes and I decided at the end of writing my notes that zero was a bad idea. Thank you, triv. L. Ah, da, 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 da. Triv. Take away L. Mm -hmm. Okay, another way of thinking about this is just um, you want a sub OX module whose co kernel is a skyscraper. And that skyscraper is located at a point, and that point is precisely the map to A1. So we'll come back to that interpretation in a second. So I don't think I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll write down, we can, at, at the end of the day, we'll need to do a calculation in charts. And so I just want to write down two charts for um, G. So is this G some auxiliary thing that you're writing down or computation? Yes. It's a little bit like, um, imagine that I'm trying to understand the affine Grassmann in MSL2. Then I can first look at lattices that are stuck between my base lattice and T times my base lattice. And this, and so to be a lattice inside there is no condition, and this gives me a P1 um, inside my affine Grassmannian. And this is a, now I'm doing the same thing, but over a, over A1. So this G is a part of the Bayless and Greenfield Grassmannian. Yes. So this sits inside, if we call this BD, This is a closed and very simple piece of this uh, Bannins and Drinfeld grass money. And so the two charts are um, U0. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so both these charts are isomorphic to A2, and then they glue to give, they glue to give. Another way of saying this is any sub like this is just sub lattices in um, inside L triv whose determinant is a degree one polynomial. And I claim that any any such lattices of this one. Now um, we want to create the kind of analogous closed thing inside um, the gate screen. 
family. And this will be the same thing. So L inside L triv, such that, so this, this will map to um, our G. is one plus I want a flag at zero. So I want an L inside L modulo TL. And that's nothing but the fiber. At zero, which I could also denote L zero. So that's why I wanted to avoid L0 before. Okay, so we can write down two charts for this, but I'll do that in a second. Firstly, I want to consider the following closed subray. Sorry, just for clarity, um, that's an abusive set theoretic notation, right? Like your data, your data consists of big oh. L and little L. Thank you very much. And L is, little L is a line. Little L is a line, yeah. And this is a P, so the space of all L, um, the space of all L is G in, and this is a P1 bundle over G. Okay, uh, so now I want to consider um, the following closed subvariety. So this will be closed inside Y. So this should be pairs LL such that L is contained in the kernel of the following map. So L is included into L0. This surjects onto L0 mod, um, sorry, L triv. This surjects onto L triv, take away to mod L triv, T L, L triv. And so this is C plus C, and this surjects onto C plus C without C plus zero. So basically what I'm saying is I'm fixing, I'm only considering those lines that map to a special line in the fiber of L triv at zero. So what are the fibers So L as I said before this gives me some inclusion of L into L0 with, with um, co-kernel a skyscraper. Now there's two options. So if X is not equal to zero, then this means that um, this means that this composition 
So basically, if x is not equal to zero, and I take, so this, I'm sorry, this should be triv. So if I take fibers of this here at zero, then I get an isomorphism. So this says that L zero is isomorphic. Zero. So hence, um, L is uniquely defined. Uniquely um, determined. So this imp this implies that the the fiber is the the same as the fiber in G. So this says that the fiber is P one. If X is zero, then that tells me that this map. as rank one. And now there's two possibilities. The first possibility, so let's call this map phi. The image of phi is C plus zero. So then L is free and I get a P1. Uh, the other option is when phi doesn't hit um, C plus zero. In that case, um, in that case, so when um, L is the kernel of phi, in that case, L um, is free. We get a P1. So the conclusion is that the fiber over zero is P1 union P1 at, at a point, which is the single, sorry, yeah, just, I'll just say at a point. So in the first case, that condition on the image of phi determines, means that big L is uniquely determined. Yes, so L. That's why we have one P1. L um, fixed. Okay, and you can um, convince yourself that these are the two Schubert curves inside the affine flag variety. Um, ah, so I'm out of time. So in the notes, there's charts which show that this gen degeneration is indeed locally x, y, epsilon.
Um, and yeah, I'm sorry, I was very um, excited to finally be able to do this calculation because I've tried to do it about three times before and failed, but it's maybe not so exciting to see it if you um, either it's obvious to you or you've never tried to do it before. Um, but yeah, so if you are interested in the notes, there's kind of a, a calculation in charts that makes it very explicit. Okay. And no doubt we will re revisit this example. So it might be worth going over if you want to stay in touch with the course. So thank you. As, as always, I will um, stick around for a, few, for a few minutes to answer any questions.